screen with Dostoevsky's image on it. Excellent, good. Um, so, yeah, just a, a few introductory uh, or remarks. Uh, when when Bill uh, approached me about ten days ago uh, as to whether I might be game for this, or two weeks ago. Um, the timing happened to be very serendipitous. I was just wrapping up a book and uh, thought that would be a nice change of pace. And uh, as usual, when I finish up a long project, I like to reward myself with a great book or a great novel of some kind. And it seemed like a good, as good a time as any to reread The Brothers Karamazov. I think this one is my fourth round. I remember reading it first and probably understanding very little when I was in my late teens and I read it in a German translation. And then uh, a couple of decades later, I read the Constance Garnett translation, which of course for many, many decades was really the default text for English language readers. And then uh, the, I more recently read the David Macduff translation, which I find to be quite good. Um, but then since I gather from Bill that, that most of you will be using the Pevia Volokonsky translation, I thought I'd get a hold of that and have been tearing through it and I'm almost done. Um, and I think it is indeed a very reliable text. With Constance Garnett, by the way, for those of you who happen to have the old everyman version of the novel, which is translated by her, uh, you need to take that with a grain of salt. She took it upon herself um, to make Dostoevsky sound like a very mannered and polite mid-Victorian, um, which uh, I dare say he was not. Um, and so there, there is a way in which she smooths out the, the diction uh, of characters to the point that they all seem suddenly well-behaved, which when you look at what they're actually saying, let alone doing, seems uh, somewhat counterintuitive. Um, so in any event, I do think the, the sort of the linguistic complexity of the book, to the extent that I can judge that, comes through very nicely in the more recent translations by Macduff and especially by Pavia and Volokonsky. I'll have a little more to say about that in a moment. Um, and now Bill asked me to say a few things about Dostoevsky's biography. I, I will, but, but indeed very little, because it is, there is so much that I want to get to regarding the last novel uh, that he wrote um, that, that I'd rather not tarry with too much with the biography. Um, just a few points, um, because they are obviously pertinent to the novel itself. Um, Dostoevsky was uh, the son of a physician, um, a father who by most accounts that we have was also a very abusive man. Um, a part of the lower gentry, they owned serfs. Uh, Dostoevsky was born in 1821. This emancipation of the serfs didn't happen until 40 years later, so in 1861. Um, and um, uh, at some point when Dostoevsky went uh, to Petersburg to study engineering, he was sort of in his late teens, uh, some of the serfs uh, who apparently had also been at the receiving end of the father's abusive behavior decided to murder him. And so uh, does, that was obviously a, f a fairly significant uh, kind of event in his early life. Um, Another event that has, a, uh, that in a way overshadows much of his life and biography uh, has to do with um, his association in his early years as an author with the so-called liberal progressive uh, political groups that were um, beginning to be quite uh, appealing to, uh, uh, to the intelligentsia in Petersburg especially. Um, Dostoevsky had published an early book about the life of common and poor people called Poor Folk. Uh, that was you know, ravely reviewed by the most influential critic, uh, Vissarion Belinsky, in 1844 when it appeared. And he was, so he became the darling of the political progressives uh, at that time. Um, soon enough, as we will see, he fell out with them. And in fact, uh, the Brothers Karamazov is very much a critique of uh, a kind of socialist uh, uh, utopia. Uh, 
um, his association, fleeting though it was, with a circle of so-called radicals uh, called the so-called Petrashevsky circle actually uh, caused uh, Dostoevsky to be uh, imprisoned when the whole, um, when pretty much all the members of that group were imprisoned in the police action. Uh, at a point when, you know, as you may know, in 1848, 1849, uh, revolutions were spreading all over Europe. The French monarchy, a monarch was deposed, uh, Louis Philippe was deposed in France, uh, you had unrest uh, in Germany, uh, the king there was forced to accept the constitution. So uh, all these sort of post-Napoleonic monarchies were sort of tottering. Uh, uh, on their feet of clay and, and falling during those years. And obviously Russia being always very much looking toward the West, uh, the Russian um, uh, establishment was deeply worried that, that their time might be up as well. And so political repression uh, was uh, certainly very uh, acute at this point. And um, so the circle was uh, imprisoned, the Petrashevsky circle, and, and Dostoevsky was associated with it, was sentenced uh, and uh, initially to death. I will come back to that in a moment. Um, there is some doubt as to whether that sentence was really ever meant to be uh, implemented, but they, they had a certain procedure whereby the prisoners would be walked out into the yard would be lined up, the firing squad would be set up, they would raise their rifles and then at the last minute uh, a messenger would arrive uh, seemingly out of the blue and declare that they had been pardoned. Um, this happened with such regularity that people who observed it came to suspect it was actually a kind of theatrical game, but it had its uh, uh, indelible effect on Dostoevsky who was, uh, who never forgot about this moment of how he felt when he thought he was about to be shot. And who made that a topic in a number of his books. It comes up in Crime and Punishment. It comes up also in his novel Demons from 1871, 72. And then uh, the sentence was commuted uh, to uh, la uh, long-term imprisonment, uh, which in the end turned out to be five years in Omsk, Siberia. And it was there that Dostoevsky underwent a major conversion, you could say, um, studying very, very intently the Old Testament, which was pretty much the only book prisoners were allowed to have. I I'm, I'm sorry, the New Testament, uh, which was pretty much the only book prisoners were allowed to have in the prison. And um, uh, his, his entire political and religious outlook uh, profoundly shifted during that five-year term, following which he was uh, allowed to stay in Semipalatinsk in southern Siberia uh, before eventually receiving permission to return to Moscow. Um, at that point, his literary career takes off, as you may know, with you no know, notes from the underground and crime and punishment in 1864 and so forth. Um, by the time we get to the brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky is 57, 58 years old. And I want to talk now a little bit more about the inception of the novel and then begin to look uh, at what kind of novel it is and then eventually wrap up with a few remarks about what Dostoevsky understood by realism, because it really is a rather different conception of realism than most 19th century novels tend to offer us. So I'm gonna walk my way through some slides here, which will involve some reading. If the text is too small, please let me know. How does that look? Can you read that? Good, okay. So I've, I've been, you know, going through a number of, uh, there's a volume of uh, selected letters that, um, that I have been reading in years past. It's um, an excerpt. There is actually a, a publication of his complete letters uh, in English, uh, but that's out of print and very hard to get. And so I haven't been able to do that. But the selection, which is prepared by Dostoevsky's great biographer, Joseph Frank, um, is certainly worthwhile. One of the letters uh, 
from 1876, so about two years before he is really writing the novel, uh, already hints very much at the concerns that are on his mind. Uh, speaking, as, uh, as you can read here, in preparation for a very long novel I've decided to write, I felt it would be worthwhile to devote myself to a special study, not of reality in the strict sense, but a study of specific aspects of current development. As I see it, one of the most important of contemporary problems is, for instance, the younger generation, as well as the contemporary Russian family. And that will indeed be a focal point. Uh, and he knew this well before he started the novel. Some of the letters that he says he had been receiving in response to his writer's diary, which he published uh, a mix of journalism, short stories, and uh, rebuttals um, uh, for between 1876 and 77, uh, it's a big two volume work uh, available in English and quite fascinating to read. Uh, so he receives a lot of letters and then responds to them and they, those responses make, the, make their way into his writer's diary, which was published. He says, some of the letters I've been receiving have left the impression that has more and more preoccupied me. Question, namely, where is our common ground? Which are the points on which we people of different opinions can all agree. And Dostoevsky's great fear clearly was that that common ground had fundamentally been lost. I suppose you can see why this is a very timely novel to read. Um, there are, at the same time, this book is um, also an attempt by Dostoevsky to map a way forward toward what he thought in later years so starting really with demons uh, in 1871, 72, what he increasingly envisions as a kind of uh, resurgence of a, uh, of a Russian popular piety that um, associated him more really with orthodoxy than with the pan-Slavic movement, to which he was also quite sympathetic. Um, there are, he writes, in 1877 in Russia, incomparably more truly Russian people with a true and virtuous Russian way of looking at things, free of distorted Petersburg intellectualism than I could have imagined two years ago. There are many things to indicate a thirst for a new righteous life, a profound faith in an impending change in our intelligentsia's way of thinking, an intelligentsia that has lost contact with the people. And that is really where one sees how Dostoevsky had moved away from his liberal and progressive friends of the 1840s and had increasingly come to suspect that they were in fact uh, uh, prone to a certain kind of intellectual pride and condescension when it came to the common man. And, and he really was very intent on writing uh, novels that would stage this conflict, this disconnect between the, uh, the life of intellectual circles in a few urban centers and the vast mass of nameless and unsung Russians uh, who, whose voice rarely ever seemed to be heard. It is no accident, by the way, in this regard, that it takes us, I think, until about page 580 or something, before we learn the name of the town in which all these events of Brothers Karamazov take place. The idea really in some ways is that it could be any town in Russia. Um, and he didn't want it to be somehow sort of restricted in our imagination to a very particular place. There's a kind of allegorical intention there. Um, part of I mean, no doubt you, you all, if, I don't know how far you've read into the book, but if you have read into book five of the novel, then you will have likely reached the, the famous chapter of the Grand Inquisitor, uh, quite possibly the most famous novel chapter in world literature. Um, and it is obviously an issue that what, what he works out there is an issue that had in fact been on Dostoevsky's mind for a long time, namely this question as to whether in the end, the only concern that should be on the minds of 
uh, on the minds of politicians and people in positions of responsibility is to ameliorate the material conditions of people. Um, and to assume, as of course a great deal of progressivist thinking in the 19th century, say in Hegel in Germany or in Auguste Comte in France, uh, uh, in the Chartist movement in England, the same assumption always seemed to be underlying their activities and their writings and their um, claims, namely that once you have produced a material affluence on a vast scale, you will have a happy and a just society and also a morally good society. By the time he writes Brothers Dost uh, Karamazov, Dostoevsky doesn't believe that at all. He completely rejects that notion. The idea of a philosophy that is concerned, as he puts it, with bread only has simply lost all credibility for him. As he writes in a letter to a friend uh, in 1876, Contemporary socialism eliminates Christ from everything and is concerned above all with bread. It calls in science and asserts that the sole cause of human miseries is poverty, the struggle for existence, the corrupting environment. But Christ knew that bread alone does not bring life to man and if beside bread man is not possessed of spiritual life, he will languish and die, go insane, kill himself or abandon himself to pagan fantasies. Um, I think that um, this is a motif you'll want to keep in mind. I don't want to offer spoilers for those of you who haven't read through the novel yet, but at a certain point, uh, one, uh, the, the character, one of the major characters accused of murder uh, in the novel will be offered, uh, a, a, there is an attempt made to defend him in court by claiming that he had been the victim of circumstance and was rendered by adverse circumstances temporarily insane. And Dostoevsky actually has the accused himself reject that attempt to defend him by such means. He will not have it because he believes it is patently false, not just in his case, but as a defense of, a, of an action, it is intrinsically misguided to think that somehow it's only extraneous contingent factors that make us do things. Um, all right, let's move forward. So Dostoevsky um, suffered, uh, his wife and uh, Anna Grigoryevna and Dostoevsky suffered a tremendous loss when in 1878, their son Alexei died. Um, Alexei had unfortunately inherited from his father uh, the uh, lifelong condition of epilepsy and in Alexei's case uh, he succumbed to a particularly gruesome attack of epilepsy um, and died in 1878. I can't quite recall offhand now how old he was but um, I don't, and certainly not more than 12 years old, probably less. Um, it was a tremendous blow, as you can obviously imagine. Dostoevsky went to a famous monastery for a while, Optina Pustin Monastery, and spent time there, which allowed him actually also to learn a great deal about monastic life, which will become quite important for him to, uh, as he proceeds to write book six of the novel about Father Zosima and monastic existence. Um, but then he... By then he committed himself, however, to writing and publishing the novel. And he publishes it as he often did in serial form. Um, that meant uh, he would uh, publish uh, a, a number of chapters in uh, the journal, a conservative Russian periodical called the Russian Herald. And by the choice of that journal, he already uh, outed himself as a conservative and in the eyes of many actually as a reactionary figure. Um, but that was a very deliberate choice. Um, and uh, he had to do so because he had to earn a living and he couldn't spend two years writing a novel as it were on spec uh, because he wouldn't have had any money to live on in those two years. So he would always get an advance for the next segment of the novel to be 
written and then published, and, and so it went. Um, and uh, Anna Grigoryevna, his wife, uh, who also assisted with copying, proofreading, and also just keeping him going, um, uh, obviously was an extraordinarily circumspect and pragmatic person and was able to make sure that he kept to the publication schedule, which was quite important. Um, so, um, just to give you an impression, uh, something that has often interested me is, is how did Russians see their own world in the 19th century? And I found it over the years quite interesting in studying Russian painters uh, and the work of Isaac Levitan, uh, who was born in 1860, died in 1900, uh, is, stands out as particularly uh, inspiring. Um, this, I think, is, is a quite typical painting. I thought I'd just put it in here, I'll have a couple more coming later. Um, anyway, after he returns from the monastery, Dostoevsky proceeds and he writes and writes and writes. But he doesn't actually have a master plan. He doesn't know how the novel will end. So one of the things that I keep finding remarkable is when you read this book multiple times, you realize that early on in the book, there are little hints thrown out that will become quite crucial in the plot much, much later. But we know from his notebooks and from uh, some of his letters in which he still uh, hems and haws about how he's to proceed, we know that he hadn't actually devised a complete plot for the novel that that took a while. We know that, for instance, in his earlier book from 1869, The Idiot, um, he actually proceeded to write a number of chapters and then burned them because he realized he had written himself into a dead end and then started again. So this is a kind of high risk uh, approach to writing a book, especially when you know that your livelihood depends on it. Um, and, but, he does, and in this case, it worked out magnificently. Um, but there is a, there was certainly a kind of gamble to it, and Dostoevsky, as you may know, had plenty of experience with gambling. Very little of it happy. Um, so he was very anxious also, and this is part of the political climate, which in the 1870s had, if anything, much intensified in its sort of uh, adversarial nature. He was very worried about censorship. Censorship was a major factor, and the chapter of rebellion in particular, uh, Dostoevsky very well understood, was likely to raise uh, more than a few eyebrows among the people entrusted with censoring and granting or refusing, as the case may be, permission to print. If you have read the chapter, I think you will quickly see why, because it is a profoundly, uh, I mean, it is a profoundly um, rebellious view of the entire organization of Russian life, society, the political order, and especially the moral order uh, of the world in which Russian readers of Dostoevsky uh, found themselves. And it is, I think, part of what is interesting about Dostoevsky's last novel in particular, but certainly about most of his later books, uh, is that he, when it comes to the atheism, to the anarchism and the radicalism of people with whom he quite clearly disagreed, he always dug very deep trying to give their views the strongest possible expression. He never set up a straw man when it came down to sort of confronting a social vision with which he vehemently disagrees. And in the case of this chapter, a lot of critics thought he had succeeded too well. That he, in fact, what he had offered in the voice of Ivan was a kind of refutation of the moral political order from which that order couldn't possibly recover. And so uh, Dostoevsky kept insisting in letters to his friends, no, no, uh, the next book will offer the refutation, book six, which is focused on the monastic life of Father Zosima and 
and his uh, peers, and of course, Alyosha. But this is a kind of maximalism that I think is fascinating to observe. Um, there's a risk in that in its own right. Uh, the possibility simply that in the end, the novel will have an effect that Dostoevsky actually never intended. All right, um, let me read go on a little further here. Um, so um, I talked a little bit about the um, uh, choice of the journal uh, and uh, that it sort of identifies him politically. Um, now just a few facts about what was happening while he was writing the novel, because this is in fact, those are the three years when things really were heating up. In um, the days just after the first book of the novel appeared, uh, just a few days, the governor general of Kharkov was assassinated. Um, a month later, an attempt to assassinate the chief of police, of the secret police, the Chetka, which was a loathed organization uh, amongst Russian intellectuals, um, barely failed. And a month later, the first of many attempts uh, on the life of the Tsar, Alexander II, uh, also failed. Um, the anarchists would actually succeed a, um, um, about a month after Dostoevsky's death in 1881. Uh, no, he dies late in January and in February, the Tsar is in fact uh, assassinated. Um, let me proceed. So yeah, this is actually just one more painting by Levitan here called Vladimirska Road. Um, once a prisoner was pardoned, that is to say not executed, but sent to Siberia, um, they would be offered a, um, a journey on foot typically to walk there. And Vladimirka Road is the road that the prisoners walked from Moscow all the way to Siberia. You, you will know perhaps that Russia has 11 time zones. Um, by the time they would have reached Oms, they would have been, I don't know, five or six time zones uh, beyond Moscow. Uh, so it was a bit of a hike. Um, and um, you could also understand why that being so, uh, the prison didn't feel terribly concerned about prisoners trying to escape, <laughs> because where would you escape to? Um, so uh, it's, uh, it was an extraordinary thing. I mean, you were in this situation, you were literally at the end of the world, or so at least it felt to them. Um, this is a painting by Levitan from 1892. Now, what kind of novel is Brothers Karamazov? And there is obviously no straightforward answer here. It is, it is, as I would put it, many novels in one. And the first thing to notice is that Dostoevsky's approach to the novel is quite atypical when you compare him, say, to George Eliot or Flaubert um, or Balzac. Um, or especially Tolstoy or Turgenev, Turgenev's Fathers and Sons, a book whose very title already uh, suggests that Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov might be a response of sorts. Um, I would put it this way. Um, with Tolstoy in particular, uh, if you have read War and Peace or uh, Anna Karenina uh, or any of his uh, novellas, um, what you have is, is, if you think of it in terms of, of photography, you have someone with a wide angle lens doing tremendous panoramic shots with very high resolution of detail. With Dostoevsky, you have someone who uses a macro and who always goes way up close to watch how people talk to one another, how they respond and who pays really extraordinary attention to the sort of micro shifts in conversation that happen at the spur of the moment. And who is very attentive to the way that the characters tend to respond to one another in ways that they often don't seem to have premeditated at all. And so Dostoevsky is writing, I mean, his no approach to the novel is very much that of a dramatist. The core of his books 
is always dialogue. And um, so that's one of the things to which I'll come back. But, but what other kinds of novels are sort of uh, rolled into this one? There's, of course, the sensational novel or the crime novel. Think of Wilkie Collins in England, The Moonstone and things like that, um, The Woman in White. Um, notice how that shows up in the kind of reportage style of the narrator. The narrator often doesn't quite know enough to really give us fully reliable information at the time that he's telling something. Well, there are many reasons, one of which is it enhances a sense of drama. But another, perhaps even more obvious one, is that Dostoevsky himself didn't know yet because he hadn't quite pushed the narrative planning sufficiently far ahead. So there is, uh, moreover, the fact that the novel itself appears in a serial format makes, a, a, it makes then a certain sense in light of that for Dostoevsky to sort of also use this reporter style narration of someone who's sort of gathering information from wherever uh, he can pull it um, and beginning to sort of build towards some kind of cohesive picture of what happened and why. Um, there are also, there are some, uh, I, I suppose, let me back up and say, one of the things that we always think of when we hear Dostoevsky is that it's, uh, it's terribly serious, uh, that things are grim and bound to get worse. Um, and of course, often that is true, but Dostoevsky is also wickedly funny. Um, and the humor often doesn't translate as clearly to Western readers as it should. Uh, for instance, think of the opening lines from uh, Notes from the Underground, in which the, this sort of uh, this uh, strange hypochondriac and uh, excessively introspective narrator says, you know, that uh, he is a sick man. Uh, uh, he is not a superstitious man, but he says, I do consult doctors. Um, and there are all these kind of little asides that actually suggest that Dostoevsky has often a lot of wit uh, in, built into it. Um, much of that got ironed out in the history of translations, I gather, um, and perhaps to some extent has now been restored here. Um, when you get to the chapter, chapter 9 in book 11, uh, where Ivan meets the devil, um, the way that the devil talks would have been well understood by most contemporary readers of Dostoevsky to be a sort of rather spot on imitation of uh, Turgenev, the novelist, um, with whom Dostoevsky had serious disagreements. Um, so anyway, just to give an idea, and, and then there is also the fact that in the book itself, newspapers play a certain role. Um, for instance, Madame Koklakov, is, has recently subscribed to a paper from St. Petersburg called Rumor. Um, just no, not to put too fine a point on it, I guess. Um, second, it is a novel about fathers and children. And children actually in Dostoevsky's fiction play a, a major role all the time. And uh, perhaps arguably nowhere more so than in this last novel. Um, he was, uh, Dostoevsky was fascinated with children and uh, apparently was also uh, in every way the father that um, his own father had never been. Um, they are prominent and there is a kind of subplot that you will get to if you haven't already uh, involving actually friendship bet uh, between children, a friendship born out of a conflict initially. Um, quite, quite a wonderful uh, moment. Um, what accounts for this? Well, for Dostoevsky, the breakdown of the family is in many ways a metaphor for the breakdown of society. When there is a complete disconnect between generations, that means implicitly that the young generation is no longer able to draw on the past as a resource for knowledge. And um, in, um, no, in one case, uh, chapter five, book 12, uh, I think it is Ivan who remarks that, you know, all children desire the death of their fathers. Uh, that's obviously spoken very much like the kind of progressive intellectual 
that told uh, that uh, Dostoevsky had met uh, in his earlier years, figures like Alexander Herzen or Vissarion Belinsky, eminent critics, uh, and very much Western in their orientation. There is, moreover, if you look at, at, at all of Dostoevsky's novels, you will almost never, there are a couple of minor figures, but almost never will you find a family that is intact. They're all broken in some way or another. He calls them at some point, uh, I think Joseph Frank calls them uh, the accidental family, but it is, I think, a phrase lifted actually from one of Dostoevsky's letters. Uh, a family that's destroyed or damaged by separation, abuse, neglect, uh, death, uh, a family in which there are orphans uh, left behind. Uh, think, for instance, of the fact that, I, uh, that uh, Fyodor Pavlovich um, Dostoevsky, the old Dostoevsky, um, for most of his life never seemed to quite remember that he had sons. Um, they, they sort of seem to exist somewhere out there, but, but uh, they were sort of simply part of the ambient scenery. He didn't seem to have any understanding of himself as being a father, a person who should help form their way, uh, help shape their way in life. Um, so this kind of breakdown was for Dostoevsky uh, quite uh, at the front of much of his fiction. Uh, it is a book also, a novel about the coming age of atheism. Um, and here Dostoevsky seems to have gone through a number of views. Um, the first being that um, Russian, uh, after between 1864 with um, Crime and Punishment, which ends with a kind of scene of reconciliation and forgiveness, um, perhaps a bit uh, erring, a bit on the sentimental side. And then uh, going forward, Dostoevsky felt that um, the novel had to sort of map out for us a way forward uh, that was an alternative, a positive alternative to atheism, disbelief, and anarchy. By the brothers, by the time we get to the brothers Karamazov, there are sort of uh, different notes creeping in. One of which is that Dostoevsky still felt that this was indeed the way things would eventually turn out. But in his late letters, he will actually at times hint that he thinks uh, Russia will have to sort of drink the cup of atheism and anarchy all the way to the dregs before it will recover. And he foresees an age of, of sort of Hobbesian anarchy and of the crudest materialism. And many people think that his late letters and his late writings are in many ways a, a harbinger of the Bolshevik era that was to come uh, three decades later. Um, in any event, um, uh, his earlier novel, Demons, had framed this issue of atheism very clearly. There, the case is that of a student who is murdered by his friends because the student, uh, uh, Shatov, had thought his friends were on the same page with him and that what they were all jointly working toward would be a world of Christian renewal, a kind of Christian social utopia. He had utterly misread his friends. They were profoundly hostile to the idea of any kind of normative, metaphysical, or Christian framework. And when that disagreement became clear, they suspected that he might rat them out to the authorities, and they murder him. The description of that murder itself is, is absolutely stunning. Um, uh, it's it's uh, something that I don't think I've ever read in any other novel. Um, it's really um, Dostoevsky's ability to sort of bring things, uh, show the psychological costs of such a deed are simply unparalleled. Um, let me, okay, so it is, uh, of course, with all that said, it is still a novel deeply concerned with social issues, poverty, uh, the immiseration and mistreatment of women, actually a topic that had occupied Dostoevsky time and again, uh, also very much in the novel The Idiot, 
where the perhaps his most extraordinary figure, um, Nastasia Filipovna, is in many ways the quint the first and in many ways the quintessential type of a woman who in her young years had suffered abuse, most likely sexual abuse. And the way that Dostoevsky shows the long-term devastation of her psyche by that and makes that itself a plot element in that novel is, is quite extraordinary. Um, there is, um, uh, so there is that, there is, uh, However, the greater issue that comes up actually verbatim is the issue of social and familial disorder. Besporyadok uh, is the Russian word for it. Besporyadok um, is a sort of anarchy, either on the large, but also possibly on the small scale in the family. If you want to see a good case of it and you happen to have the um, novel in front of you, you can look at page 581 in Brothers Karamazov, where Liza, the uh, physically disabled young woman, uh, suddenly erupts in these, uh, oh, in these fantasies, speaking with Alyosha, about how she would like to see, in fact, everything burned down, and would like to see nothing more than total disorder. Um, it's a kind of despair that wants to, in a way, see itself objectively realized as material anarchy. Um, there are many cases in the novel, beginning, of course, with the outrageous behavior of the old Karamazov, the father, in, at the monastery, um, where characters, in a way, inject elements of disorder and verbal sort of mayhem into social scene, uh, scenes, uh, gatherings, uh, quite on a whim, it seems. Something that always perplexed Dostoevsky's critics who thought that, you know, most the characters in a realist novel speak in full sentences and they are fully in, con no, they are in full control of their intentions and their long-term objectives. Dostoevsky, uh, being arguably the shrewdest psychologist among all the 19th century novelists, um, begged to disagree. And he thought there was something uh, always quite unfathomable at the, at the bottom of most, if not all people. By the way, uh, as an aside, the one writer who more than anyone responded to that particular aspect of Dostoevsky was uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche read Dostoevsky in French translations. Uh, if you um, uh, his letters, uh, starting in the early 1880s, at which point Nietzsche became aware of Dostoevsky, uh, show that he's absolutely obsessed with him. He uh, did not, however, understand the deeper Christian motifs that Dostoevsky was really trying to pursue in his fiction. But when it comes to the psychology, there are many spots in Nietzsche's, say, uh, human, or to human, or Beyond Good and Evil and the Genealogy of Morals, those late books by Nietzsche, where he would say that is straight out of Dostoevsky, sometimes almost verbatim, uh, quite fascinating. Um, they came to very different conclusions as to what should be done, but in terms of their diagnosis of what ailed humanity in the mid to late 19th century, they were pretty much on the page. Um, By the way, um, if any of you are interested, I'm happy to share this. I just jotted these notes down yesterday and today. I'm happy to share this. I can forward the PowerPoint presentation to Bill if you want to make it available. Um, that's fine with me. Um, that would be great. Yeah. Um, I'll skip this one on the social novel for now, but now mention briefly the figure of Vladimir Sol Sol Solovyev, uh, spelling is sometimes different of the last name. Uh, instead of I-E-V, it can also be Y-O-V, Solovyov. Um, arguably the most important Russian philosopher of the 19th century, um, and uh, no, quite a bit younger than Dostoevsky, but in Dostoevsky's late years, a very close friend and someone on whom the figure of Alyosha is to a certain extent modeled. 
like Dostoevsky, Solovyev had also had an early sort of radical materialist phase and then also made a major U-turn and realized that was going absolutely nowhere. Um, and his uh, lectures, um, especially his three discourses on God manhood, uh, really, uh, which is to say on the incarnation, um, were uh, actually Dostoevsky attended. He read, of course, a lot more of uh, Solovyev's writings. It's also the only time, actually, that Dostoevsky and Tolstoy are known to have been in the same room. Um, and uh, they never were introduced to one another because the person who knew that both were there and uh, thought that, uh, that Tolstoy might not want it. <laughs> um, an opportunity missed, um, what can I say? Um, now, we often hear that Dostoevsky is the no uh, Dostoevsky's novels are novels of ideas, and that in a way is true, but with one very important qualification, I think, um, and, and that is that um, in Dostoevsky, the ideas don't exist ever separately from a particular character. Um, in the introduction to um, his novel Demons, uh, Pevian Volokonsky rightly point out that the, the earlier translation uh, of that work uh, under the title The Possessed, in many ways is misleading. The demons who possess characters are the ideas. So it's not that the characters are somehow demonic. They become demonic to the extent that their psyche is colonized by a particular kind of ideology. And so the ideas are really in many ways the demon that takes hold of a character and forms or more likely deforms that character. Um, as one of the um, uh, critics writes about uh, Dostoevsky. Uh, Dostoevsky was writing not about ideas, but about people who were bitten by ideas. And nice way of putting it. Um, and uh, Ivan Karamazov is perhaps the most conspicuous instance of that. Um, so keep that in mind. It's not that Ivan is somehow the cool rationalist who holds forth and sort of spews the gospel of, uh, of socialism and progressivism and materialism. Um, if it was all that, he'd be something of a cardboard character. But the more we progress in the novel, we, the more we realize that in fact, Ivan is deeply troubled by the fact that those ideas to which up to a point he is indeed committed, also seem to be leading him in, uh, down a dead end road. A point at which once you have dispensed with the idea of God um, altogether, everything, as is famously said, would be permitted. And that's where the crisis comes to head in book 11 when he meets the devil. Yes, um, Bill. You're still muted. Please keep going, Thomas. Oh, okay, good. I thought you had... Someone had said they had to go and I waved goodbye to Oh, okay, them. okay, very well. Good. Um, I'm almost done, though. Um, uh, on psychology, I, I've talked already somewhat about it. Um, let's just simply say this. In Dostoevsky... Um, Characters are not types, but characters seem to sort of enter the scene with a certain self-image. Say uh, the older Karamazov says, oh, I'm a buffoon. I, I just say crazy things all the time and this is who I am. Um, but he also keeps being, uh, he also reflects on that being really rather strange and he's somewhat disturbed by it actually. So. The characters, in a way, are not simply a type, 
but they, they understand themselves as having a certain tendency, but at the same time seem to be constantly troubled by that fact. Which is one of the reasons why in Dostoevsky a character never quite feels settled. And they have the potential way to, uh, up to the last pages of a novel to surprise us. Um, this is where Dostoevsky breaks with the realist dogma of most of his contemporaries. Where, you know, a certain character, in, including, including um, uh, Tolstoy, who for all his greatness, which Dostoevsky acknowledged, does ultimately not quite give the characters that kind of complexity. You see, for instance, in you know, Pyotr Bezov, or in War and Peace, or in Konstantin Levin, or Kitty Chabansky in Anna Karenina, you see a kind of gradual clarification of who they are. And the more they progress in the book, the less they seem to be a trouble to themselves, or, obversely, uh, in the case of Anna Karenina herself, they head on a straight descending line, line down toward catastrophe. But in Dostoevsky, you have more of a kind of seismographic movement in which there are spikes of lucidity puncturing what is otherwise often very impulsive and uh, often self-destructive behavior serving no discernible end. Um, so there is a realism to that too, I, I should think, but it is simply one that in the grammar of the novel, as it was by then well established as an art form, people had trouble reconciling with their reading expectations. Um, I had already talked a little bit about the narrator just uh, on that, uh, I won't dilate on that now. Um, I focused also on the sort of um, particular quality of his uh, dramatic style, of his dialogue-driven style. Notice that, um, and this is perhaps where, coming back, as I said I would, to the issue of translation, where we are perhaps at the gravest disadvantage by not reading it in the original, uh, is that we cannot always detect as clearly how idiosyncratic the speech patterns of characters are. For instance, the elder Zosima speaks in a kind of um, almost church Slavonic Russian, so critics have observed, a language that is not easily understood even by native Russian speakers, where the cadence of sentences, certain patterns of repetition of words and phrases, simply seems, uh, at the very least, archaic. Much of that tends to sort of fade when we read the novel in translation. And so the idiosyncrasies of speech are, of course, in many ways also what gives characters their distinctive quality as an individual person. And that's something that where I think a translation places us perhaps at a particular disadvantage. Um, Uh, yeah, here uh, at the bottom of this slide, you know, echoes of church Slavonic and the quote, emotional coloring of ceremonial and ideal tranquility, frequent repetition of the same words and phrases, uh, as Joseph Frank mentions in his biography. By the way, um, just for those of you who want to go further, uh, um, I, I, it's probably fair to say that uh, over the last 60 or so years, there has been no greater accomplishment in the difficult genre of literary biography than the five volume biography of Joseph Frank uh, of Dostoevsky. It is without question the most extraordinary achievement. Um, and it gives you a, an extraordinary insight into the entire world of, of Dostoevsky, of Russia in the 19th century and of his fiction. Um, so, and it's magnificently well written. To those, for those of you who have not time or perhaps quite the endurance for five volumes, there is a one volume edition of that same biography, beautifully and very thoughtfully redacted by an editor. It still clocks in at a thousand pages, but that's, that's the low calorie version anyway. 
Um, so also another book I could recommend for those who want to, so because this is a very sparsely annotated edition, the uh, Vol uh, Pevia Volokonsky edition, uh, there is the uh, Karamazov Companion. Uh, it's a rather useful, not, not quite recent book, it's from 1981, but there's a lot of information in it that you may find quite, quite useful. Also, there exists, although I don't have it with me, a Dostoevsky encyclopedia, in which you can look up particular things. Uh, I think there's some 260 entries or so, some short, but some others quite long, uh, that contains also a lot of very helpful information. That just uh, by and by. But uh, in terms of uh, overall, an overall picture of his world, Joseph Frank's biography is, is really the place to go. Um, I think I will leave it at that. Uh, I, this last slide we can, you can look at next uh, on your own when, when Bill forwards this. Uh, it has to do with scriptural references uh, in the novel. Um, uh, and in particular, the, the book that always hovers in the margins, as you can well imagine, of a book about such extraordinary tri tribulations as the Brothers Karamazov is, of course, the book of Job. And um, Dostoevsky, uh, in a letter to his wife from 1875, says, I'm reading the book of Job and it transports me into ecstasy. I put the book down and pace the room for as much as an hour. I almost weep. It is a strange thing, Anya. This book was one of the first things that impressed me in life at a time when I was still almost a baby. And in many ways, that book is really at the heart of so much of the novel. And so I think if you do anything in terms of scriptural reading, reread the book of Job as you proceed through the novel. Um, that would be my suggestion. I think that's all I want to say. And perhaps there are a few questions. And I'll click out of the uh, presentation now. If anyone has a question, if you raise your hand, I could just unmute you if you're muted or you can unmute yourself, I think. Yeah, you can. I was going to say, Thomas, you're our living encyclopedia here. So. Well, thank you. Not true, but thank you. <laughs> Don't be bashful. Tom, we can't hear you. Uh, I have a comment, not a question. Yes. Is that okay? I, I, because I work as a translator, I, I know a little bit about the, the translators you mentioned and thought maybe the group would find that interesting. Both the Constance Garnett and the Puvir Volonsky team are, are lionized and vilified in the translation profession. Yeah. Constance Garnett lionized because she pretty much single-handedly translated all the great novels of Russian literature into English in the 19th century when you have to figure that even knowing Russian as a person living in England was quite an accomplishment, much less did she have any resources like dictionaries or the internet to look things up in. But she's, she's vilified because as Thomas said, she, she sounds, all the novels sound the same. And so what happened with this husband and wife team was that apparently Kavir, who's the American guy, was reading the brothers Karamazov and his wife, Volokhansky, who's Russian, was looking over his shoulder. He was reading in English. And she said, this, this isn't Dostoevsky. What, this, what is this? This doesn't sound like him at all. So they, what they decided to do is she's Russian. And so she began translating the novel sentence by sentence, word for word. Not any kind of embellishment, just a really literal kind of awful translation. And he is a great writer and English native speaker. So he took her word for word version and turned it into really good English. Now, some people think that's a crazy way to go about translating. And so they've been vilified for that, but they've been lionized because they're one of the few literary translators in history to get rich. What happened was um, <laughs> Oprah picked their translation of Anna Karenina for Oprah's book club. And overnight, 
the pro the publisher had to to publish like uh, I don't know hundred thousand more copies, and it ended up uh, selling something like eight hundred thousand copies in their English translation, and so they were able to um, retire to the south of France. Anyway, I thought you might find that kind of amusing. Yes, that is a that is really a, an amazing story. There is an interview I think with them in the New Yorker in which they um, which someone asked them. So after this success of Anna Karenina, what changed? And I think Pervio says, "Not much. It's just that we now need an accountant." <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, it is true that they uh, perhaps occasionally overcompensate by being so literal and so close to the word uh, sort of literal meanings that at times the, the English sounds a little bit stilted or a little bit unidiomatic even. Um, uh, my, uh, I've spoken with uh, one of my Russian uh, Slavic studies colleagues here at Duke, uh, Carol Apollonio, and, and asked you know, um, how she might recommend sort of scrutinizing the value of translations and she said a good thing to do actually, not that we're always in a position to do it, is simply to compare them. So if you have a passage you want to really write about or think through, read that passage in multiple translations and see what, what emerges. Um, Constance, uh, I mean, uh, Constance Garnett, as, as, uh, as Thomas mentioned, I mean, uh, bulldozed her way uh, through much of, I think, some 75 volumes of Russian classics, or mostly 19th century classics, um, which is even more amazing considering that she didn't learn Russian until later in life, uh, it's just from what I gather. So, but she translated almost like someone else takes dictations. Uh, but um, Hevia and Volokonsky are certainly uh, now well on the way to sort of catching up with her. They have done a great deal of, of the canonical Russian literary texts. Um, uh, although the success of Anna Karenina, I think, is not something they'll be able to reproduce simply because that book is just so um, compelling to a vast audience. Dostoevsky is always going to be the heart of sell. Um, anyway, yeah. Along the same lines of the uh, translations, what about the Avsi translation? That's the one that we've chosen to read, and oh. uh, we did a little bit of looking around, and it was uh, pretty highly recommended. What What would you say about it, and how it compares to the others? Tell me the the last name. Uh, so yes, pardon this, but uh, <laughs> Ig. <laughs> Ignat Avsi, A V S E Y. Okay, this it's is not the a Ox translation I know. Yeah. Um, this is the Oxford World Classics. Ah, okay. Oxford. Okay. I didn't realize it. I thought you were going to read the Pervia Volokonsky. Um, so I can't comment on it. Um, what I, um, there are probably some 10 translations that you could get at, at Amazon. So, um, and I did uh, a couple of years ago when I started reading more intensively again in Dostoevsky, I sort of you know, reviewed some uh, essays commenting on the various extant translations into English. Um, not all of them are kept in print. Um, part of my decision to go from here on out with the Volokonsky translation is that the probability of it staying in print is simply higher. And once I start you know, working on a text, um, I like to think that it's also going to be one I can order for my students if I find myself teaching it. Which actually brings me to the one slide I had meant to share but didn't, and that would explain why I just said what I did. Um, which is um, that um, I, I have uh, recently Having finished the book, I, I begun to sort of think of, of a new project. And whenever I want to write something, I like to sort of explore it for a number of years in my graduate teaching. Mm -hmm. And the, the courses that I have sketched out now are what I sort of feel call tentatively you know, modern lay writers of the strict observance. Um, uh, and there's actually a wonderful quote by Dostoevsky that I thought I might also introduce here. 
Dostoevsky writing in a letter. The fundamental thought is that if you distort the truth of Christ by identifying it with the aims of this world, you instantly lose the meaning of Christianity. Your reason must undoubtedly fall prey to disbelief. Instead of the true ideal of Christ, the new Tower of Babel is constructed. And so I have, over the years, come to identify a number of writers in the modern era uh, who struggled with precisely this challenge of how to, in, in a world that is either uh, divided or, in, in many cases, uh, identified itself as post-Christian, how can one think of oneself in Christian terms without either succumbing to the world or simply stepping away from it and seeing oneself in purely antinomian relation to the world? Note how that issue is brought to a head early in the novel when uh, the elder Zosima says to Alyosha, you will have to leave the monastery at least for a while and be in the world before perhaps you might come back, which no, we will not know whether he does. So the writers that I actually over the coming years will explore are, are Pascal and Kierkegaard next fall. And these will almost certainly all be courses offered through the Duke Divinity School where I have an appointment. Um, then the late Dostoevsky and Solovyov, then uh, switching to what I call the rigorists, uh, Charles Pegui and Simone Way in France, then T.S. Eliot and the French novelist, Catholic novelist, George Bernanos, and then the poet, Czeslav Milos and Karol Wojtyla, John Paul II. And these are all figures who I think in some, one way or another, as controversialists, prophets, mystics, rigorists or explorers, sort of try to address this, this fundamental challenge of um, how to reclaim Christianity as a transformative force, as I put it here, against its bourgeois trivialization or its instrumentalization by competing revolutionary and reactionary ideologies. Um, and that's really uh, the challenge, I think, uh, under which um, a great deal of Christian intellectual culture of the last 150 years at least, arguably longer, uh, has been operating. So that's, um, and so there is, um, that's sort of um, why I invest also my own prepar uh, preparations in the translation I know will be available in print in all probability in 2022 or 23. If you look at Amazon, you'll always be amazed how quickly books go out of print. And then, you know, with a novel like this, it really is no fun to work with different texts in a classroom because it gets very quickly, very difficult to actually know whether we're talking um, uh, to find the same passage and so forth. Anyway, just a, a sidebar. We look forward to scheduling a meeting like this for each of those, Thomas. <laughs> really does sound amazing. Uh, we have time for a couple of more questions, anyone else has yeah. or comments. Hi, Dr. Fowle, thank, yeah. uh, thank you for your comments on Dostoevsky. Um, I had been, I've been working through Joseph Frank's biography for a couple of years now, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's, it's taking some time. Um, but I, there's a section where he's talking about, um, I think, a letter that, that Dostoevsky had written regarding where is Masha. Um, and this was, this was a, maybe, a, um, it was about a short story, A Gentle Creature, um, where, he's, where he's pulling heavily from uh, his first wife, uh, wife's death. Yes. Um, and he started, and he talks about the annihilation of the ego and the greatest use that a person can make of their personality is uh, to annihilate the ego. And then in the annihilation of the ego, uh, the, he makes the seemingly contradictory statement that the ego is fully, uh, is fully developed um, with its annihilation and uh, consistent with the annihilation of the ego or uh, what happens when one annihilates the ego is that the ego is uh, in Dostoevsky's word like dis dispersed um, to everyone else. 
Um, so that's, I guess, how he's conceiving of um, a person loving uh, the other, um, like loving your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and so my question was, you know, would you be able to, it's, um, that, that's a little hazy to me. Uh, I mean, I, I understand um, parts of it, but it seems like there's a lot more there. Uh, Joseph Frank says it's sort of the essence of Dostoevsky's uh, philosophy that will be rear its head time and time again throughout his novels. Yeah. Um, so maybe if if you could comment on that a little bit, and then maybe talk about how that plays out in Brothers K. Uh, yes. Um, so it's it's a theological concept that. Uh, really emerges quite early in the history of Christianity, already in fifth century uh, writers, um, you see this concept, which eventually comes to be known as the concept of kenosis. Um, I think if one wants to sort of explore it, um, then some reading, at least an introductory reading in Eastern Christianity is, is actually very helpful. I can recommend, since, since we're on the topic, I can recommend one of the sort of authoritative books by John Meyendorf called um, Byzantine Theology. It's an excellent introduction by one of the leading scholars um, to Eastern theology. And uh, kenosis is a, f a very important feature. It's not certainly uh, limited to the East. You see similar, um, moves in, in rest, Western mysticism in the 13th and 14th century, say in Julian of Norwich or Gertrude of Helfter, um, you have this idea, and, and I'll give you an echo in modern poetry, uh, say uh, T.S. Eliot in Four Quartets will say a line like, to be conscious is not to be in time. And the, uh, the moment of, of pure awareness, or what Simon Way, the French uh, writer calls attention, the moment of purest attention can only be achieved if at that moment I have in, I am in no way preoccupied with myself, where I am completely, where I allow whatever happens to be in front of me, the face of a human being, a landscape, anything, where allowed to simply do its work without seeking in any way whatsoever to uh, exercise dominion over it. Um, this, is, this is an ideal to which in one way or another, I think most contemplative and mystic, uh, right, mystical writers aspire, that they think is actually the, the very purpose of our existence, that the self, is all to, to be um, concerned with being someone or representing oneself in some way is always to be really distracted from what would give our life meaning. Um, so this uh, taps into, and Eastern writers, um, especially in the sort of 14th and 15th century, there's a whole movement called hesychasm in, uh, in Eastern Orthodoxy that is very much uh, very similar to, say, Western Trappist monastic practices, the practice of silence, of extended silence. Um, uh, that's, um, that's all something that Dostoevsky was fascinated with, and I think he learned a great deal about that when he was at the monastery. My monastic life is typically um, a space in which we are allowed to experience silence and which, in which we are in a way uh, offered the opportunity to take refuge from the thraldom of ourselves where we can at least temporarily suspend preoccupations with particular goals, ambitions, with concerns that in which we are invested and almost certainly over-invested, material or otherwise. Um, so um, 
Another book I could recommend is by the Catholic theologian um, Robert Cardinal Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, uh, The Power of Silence. Um, what you describe in that letter, and I don't recall the letter right now, but, but this is, is quite characteristic of a, a sort of ultimate, uh, of what is really in many ways a central telos of Christian, Christian uh, existence. Uh, in the Eastern and also in the Catholic mystical tradition. By the way, uh, I should, in all fairness, note that when it comes to sort of Christianity and, and religion, Dostoevsky was, uh, was a man of, of considerable prejudices, the worst of which uh, actually happens to be um, his, uh, at times in late years, especially his, his extraordinary anti-Semitic outbursts. Uh, which in his um, writer's diary are quite painful to read. Um, there is a lot one could say about it. I think um, what perhaps most troubles him is that uh, in his view, and that's perhaps the most generous spin I can put on it, that most uh, of the Jewish contemporaries whom he met had in a way confused their Judaism with some political ideology, um, a progressive, liberal progressive, and inherently secular ideology. I think what he accuses deep down, what he accuses a lot of his Jewish contemporaries is really a betrayal of their religion, uh, not its fulfillment. But he's also rapidly anti-Catholic. Um, um, and there again, what troubles him is something similar, namely his suspicion that Catholics are really in many ways uh, all of a Jesuit kind, that they are all essentially trying to sort of erect Catholicism as a quasi-political tyranny over society. So again, the sense is that Catholicism in its tendencies as he perceives them. And notice, I mean, we are here dealing with the years 1869, 70, 71, First Vatican Council, the assertion of papal infallibility didn't just trouble Dostoevsky, it troubled a lot of Catholics. And so obviously he suspects there is a kind of Erastianism of, you know, the church becoming really a state church. And that for Dostoevsky, it must never do. Any Christian denomination of any kind that allows itself to be co-opted and instrumentalized for political ends, as in that quote I just read, has fundamentally betrayed its core. Um, still, that doesn't justify quite a lot, lot of the outbursts in, in uh, especially anti-Semitic outbursts in the writer's diary. They are deeply unfortunate. Um, it just shows that even very great minds, to which I think Dostoevsky certainly belongs, um, always uh, come with their own blindness. Um, yeah. Thomas, I want us to be uh, sensitive to your time because um, you're not getting paid the big bucks for this. So um, Good. And it's late at night. Uh, or not late, but no, it's getting I, that way. I still have to read. Look, I still have. To. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, no. It's I mean, it's been a pleasure, and uh, I, I hope that uh, that you will find this book if you haven't read it before. That you will find it as as astounding as I do. I will say not that that is necessarily helpful, but uh, if you have a chance to reread it after you've read it again the uh, first time, it'll make an immense difference. Um, uh, I found myself noticing a lot of things on what I think is my fourth reading that I had not properly picked up on. It may just be that I'm unusually imperceptive, but there is simply so much buried in this book that that comes out only uh, on later occasions. So I, I hope that you'll be as enthralled by it as I find myself once again. Well, the Lord bless you in all of your uh, teaching and writing and uh, being a dad 
and a husband. And anyway, hopefully we'll we'll get to do something like this uh, again. So uh, yeah. peace of the Lord be with all of you. Thanks to everyone for thank you. Uh, thank you. And then thank we you, will. Uh, I'll send out. Uh, you said you were going to share the slides with me, and I'll, yes, I'll I will send that to you. Yeah, I'll do that okay. right now. Yeah, excellent. Good. Well, good eve to everyone. Okay. Take care. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.